Hello, this is Jim Schaefer, executive producer and host of Rip Rap, the academic book television program. My guest today is May Cycli, the author of Haifa, Transformation of an Arab Society, 1918 to 1939, who will also discuss her latest project, The Politics of Memory in Palestine. Our conversation will include some reflections on the complexities of un understanding the dynamics of the Middle East, especially those between the Palestinians and the Israelis. Welcome to Rip Rap. Thank you. Um, this is the first time we've interviewed an, an author uh, about a book manuscript, although as you were pointing out before we went on um, to, for this taping, it really is both your book and, and your manuscripts as part of your work. But one of the things that I thought is really helpful is that your work is in line with this new work of looking at Israel and the Palestinian issue from a non-Zionist perspective. That is a very interesting way to look at it, saying that from a non-Zionist point of view, as though the Zionist point of view is the only view of the history of the region. In fact, uh, uh, most of the people in the area are not Zionist, but most probably from the American perspective, because that's what the media shows and that's what you know, it is the Zionist perspective. Uh, my book is for sure, and my research is from the perspective of scholarship. It is a fact-based study of uh, the community of the Palestinians. And uh, the core heart of my studies are the people. I'm a social historian, and from the very beginning of my research, whether it was in my previous book, Haifa, or in the research today that I'm doing on Palestinian villages, it is the Palestinian people who are the hard core of the issue. And in fact, if you look at my previous work and what is going on in my research today, one is the result of the other, the second is the result of the first, or it's a continuation of the first. I guess what I was trying to distinguish is there's a strain in historiography of the area of a Zionist perspective or, you know, and, and that I found it very informative, what the style that you were doing and how you're going about it because it gave more, uh, more complete, I felt, um, narrative about what's happening in the area and it's of considerable importance because just within the last several days there's been some more bombings in Haifa. I mean, this is an area that has a great deal of violence going on. Unfortunately, it is. However, the roots of the violence are very old, and uh, it is to the detriment of our understanding today and our solutions of the problem is that we don't look at the history. If you look back on the history of Haifa, which has seen terrible events in all its life, but if you look back at my book from as early as 1919, with the collapse of the Ottoman Empire and the occupation of the territories there, Palestine, by the British, and the introduction of the Jewish National Home Policy in Palestine at that time, there was a continuous strife and struggle until you take 1919, 1922, 1936, 1939, 1945, onward to 1948, which was the establishment of the State of Israel and the dispossession of the Palestinian people, which my book, in fact, talks about particularly the dispossession and the change of the city of Haifa, particularly its Arab community, from a majority into a minority. And by 1948, most of the population of Haifa had dispersed. And my work today is really looking at the results of the 1948 and it's not only Haifa. Today, I am following other Palestinian refugees, displaced Palestinians, whether they were displaced within Israel that was created on their territory or outside. So this is the type of work I have been doing. And as you said, I try to do it from a comprehensive perspective. I do not try to take a political stand, although it can't be helped. We are human beings and our perceptions of what is just and what is not just do come into our explanation of events and 
so on. However, my purpose has always been to really see the human angle, talk to the people whose history has not been properly told. Well, and it's, you know, it's looking for the roots of the Palestinian. The, and, and like you said, the history in that area. Maybe you could give a little bit of the um, demographics and factual basis for Haifa. It's not the oldest city in that area, right? In fact, Haifa is not the oldest city. Acre was much older. Jaffa is an older city. Acre has a very, very long history. Jerusalem is a very old and very important city, very holy city to all three monotheistic religions. And therefore, Haifa is a new town. And its importance is very much into the fact of its being a seaport of the Eastern Mediterranean, which as a result of the British occupation and since the mid 19th century, the city has been growing and evolving, developing, becoming a, an exporter of raw goods, raw material, raw products from the hinterland. And uh, you know, with the occupation by the British during the British mandate and the establishment of the Jewish entity that was to create at the very end the Zionist entity in Palestine, you know, uh, Haifa took another shape. It had always had a core Arab population. Before the First World War, the population were very, very minute, maybe three to 5,000 population. By 1918, it had grown to around 18,000. By 1922, it was maybe 36,000. By 40, it was over 100,000. But what is very significant is that through the help of the British mandate and through the establishment of the Zionist program, Jewish emigration grew very, very fast to the detriment in numerical issues at least to the, of the Arab population. In 1918, the Jewish population of the town did not make uh, one eighth of the population. By 1940, they were larger than half of the population of the city. So by 1948, they were definitely larger than half of the population, 1948. What is significant about Haifa is it showed us there was the application of the full Zionist program in all its perceptions, particularly the conquest of labor, conquest of land, and also the cooptation, social and political, of the population there. And therefore, it is a very significant example of what was to take place later on in many other places. After 67, this took place in many areas. I have studied thoroughly Jerusalem, the emptying of Jerusalem for the last six, seven years. I have been going annually and doing work on Jerusalem. Same, same patterns have been used, whereby physical encirclement of the Arab quarters by Jewish quarters, slow but very sure erosion of Arab presence, into these areas, economic strangulation through taxation, through various means, legal and illegal methods. And at the very end, there were systems of co-optation in which these people slowly eroded. And Jerusalem, Arab Jerusalem, East Jerusalem, has slowly been emptied. It's an issue that now, because there are so many other things we're looking at, that aspect is not seen. This is part of the research that I have done just before the research I'm doing on the villages. Well, what I was wondering as I read the book, the Haifa book, is was its position as sort of on the boundary one of the reasons that it was reacting more strongly to these different dynamics? It's very interesting because Haifa, uh, on, on many angles, spatially, uh, uh, through its uh, ethnic diversity was a very interesting example of studying the kind of dynamics that were taking place. The base Arab population were local, but it also had an influx of Levantines, quite a lot of Lebanese, other, 
other Arab Syrians and Lebanese and from other villages and towns of Palestine who came to Haifa because it was a, a very dynamic place economically. It was an industrial center. It was the British, the war, I mean, the British had also lots of hopes for Haifa. They hoped that Haifa would become the real outlet for them. I mean, the British had their own plans. In addition to what the Zionist plans were, the, the British would have liked to remain in the region. I mean, it is the end of the colonial structure, the, uh, the old colonial period. So basically, if you look at what had really happened, is that there were lots of dynamic things, dynamic dynamism going on in relations between the communities. There was quite a lot of intercommunal relations between Arabs and Jews in Haifa, which was not found in many other places, because there was a capitalist community that was Arab in addition to the uh, uh, capital that came with the Zionist development, whether in the huge industries. Haifa is the center of the largest industries that were set up through a Zionist philosophy, which means conquest of labor. So if you see the major industries, whether Nasher, Shaman, uh, uh, which is the oil, the cement, and the uh, uh, um, flour milling, you know, major, major uh, uh, things, the Rutenberg uh, uh, project of electrification, they were all concentrated in Haifa. They all needed labor. And therefore, there was a huge philosophy of importation of Jewish labor, trying to really segregate the kind of economy. And that's why, and there has been quite a lot of writings on this, whereby in the 20s and the 30s, since then, Haifa was the earliest example of the application in a mixed society. It's not like Tel Aviv, where it was all Jewish. It was a Jewish town, grew up to be a Jewish town. But Haifa was a mixed uh, 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 and it was the example of trying to see how a mixed society could survive. How did you select Haifa? I mean, it does seem to be sort of a bellwether, but uh, as you selected your topics for research, I know that you would do that very carefully. Well, I have to admit there were many, many reasons that pushed me to Haifa. My family is originally from Haifa. And therefore, it, w it made it much easier for me to have linkages to discover where and how to go about it. But that was not basically the only reason. That was one reason that was tactical. It made it much easier to do it. But the real reason is that Haifa is the best example that you can get in the Zionist experiment of the earliest application success of the Zionist experiment in Palestine. It is an experiment with patterns that are very clear in Haifa. You can't see them as clearly many other places. It became clearer in their application later on. In 67, we saw it happening in certain towns of uh, uh, the West Bank. And after 48, it did happen in other Palestinian towns because you know it was under Israel by that time. But Haifa is an important example to tell us this is the, the end, end tale of a colonial policy that was being applied. And it was very interesting for me to study it because I could see that this is a pattern that can be used anywhere in the world, that has been used in South Africa, that, that has been used in many other places of the world to the same effect where you do physical encirclement, economic strangulation, and slow but sure erosion of the socio-political structure of the society. And that way, you have it under your control. And this particular time period that you studied in the book is a prime area. That it's very prime. It is the most significant, the most important, and of course, the British were instrumental in making it happen. I mean, it couldn't have happened without having a helpful uh, uh, you know, political system to facilitate the giving of concessions, to facilitate, you know, uh, Jewish industries were really established in Haifa under hothouse conditions. They were uh, permitted quite a lot of uh, 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 leeway in taxation and so on. So it, it, it helped, you know. And of course, there was also a core issue that was a ideological base the Zionist uh, uh, society were very concerned about recreating what they saw to be 
their society. So I was able to study this in conjunction with what was happening to the Arab community, who came, well, in fact, who had to clash with what was going on. And we see the clashes in various forms, on the economic level, on the social political level, and of course, the physical level, they felt it. In fact, since the 1920s, British officers of the crown who were there said there is claustrophobia in, in Haifa. The Arabs are really feeling it and reacting to it. By the 30s, you have a grassroots peasant revolt because we had shanty towns encircling the town. So, I mean, there were very clear causes for the eruptions that took place. As I said, the what is known as the uh, peasant revolt of 36-39 is a grassroots revolt against economic strangulation, against political strangulation, where the people felt that the numerical growth of the Jewish community was going to displace them. And in the fact, it did happen. It always fascinated me in, in looking at British colonial policy, how they'd rearrange things to suit them and, you know, and manipulate the dynamics, and certainly that was a, applicable here. Yes, it is applicable here. It's applicable in many places. Even, you know, I mean, uh, 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 the French in Algeria. I mean, you take the example of the roulement, the whole policy of rolling the population of the north to the south and completely using the population as labor into in the uh, big farms that were established by the French. So, I mean, the basic principle is a colonial philosophy. I do want to talk a little bit about this, I guess you'd say we were calling the more comprehensive style of, of historiography. And as people like um, Ilan Papi and, and, and Walid Khalid, the uh, rotator forward for your book, what are some of the elements of this Yes. Specific. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, I think uh, y what what you're trying to talk about is the new historians. Right. Yes. The new historians is really is, uh, uh, Israeli historians, particularly in the last uh, ten to fifteen years, many of the archives had opened up, and a new generation of historians are out there who are not so much imbued or maybe not so much disciplined by the philosophy of the application of Zionist thinking to even writing history. Many of these people are scholars, genuine scholars, and there is a lot of them. And many of them are people I know, I respect, who are better historians than I am, and who have done great credit to themselves, to their own history, and to the writing of history. These are people who have taken history in the same fashion I did and came to similar conclusions. However, having access to archives that often oh I my. have never had access to. Really? Yes. And I, did, I was blocked from accessibility to certain archives, which I would like to talk about later. But basically, these uh, uh, historians have told stories that Palestinians since 1948 have been writing about. Walid al-Khalidi, who is a Palestinian himself, has written since 1948, immediately after the expulsion, which is known in Arab parlance, and nakba meaning the catastrophe, because of the kind of broad-based displacement of around three quarters of the population of Palestine. Over three quarters of a million. Palestinians were displaced, became refugees all over the regions around them. He wrote immediately explaining what had taken place in 1948. The arrangements, the agreements, the failures, the fall of Haifa, the fall of Jaffa, Lidda and Ramla were atrocities were committed. He did write. It was vilified historically. It was, he tried to publish in the United States in the 50s. And Nobody gave it any attention. Fortunately, today, and that is nearly 50 years later, the new historians are telling what he had told, are repeating it, but showing the factual archives from the Haganah, 
Israeli army archives, from the Israel state archives, from the Zionist archives. And therefore, these are now facts. Their analysis is also something to really uh, uh, admire, is that these are people who are factually uh, historians, who are looking at things as they are and giving the facts as they are, which I hope I try to do, although I am often, you know, I mean, my work is looked at not exactly as being uh, uh, nonpartisan because, you know, the Zionists do not like uh, this kind of story as they do not like the new historians. You, you stated that you didn't have the same access um, to some of these archives. No. When I was writing, uh, when I was collecting my data, I'm an American citizen. I've been uh, carrying an American passport for the last 32 years. And I did go uh, uh, as, as an American citizen. I don't have any other citizenship. So, I mean, I was, and of course, I was a student at Oxford. I was of a given accessibility to the Israel State Archives, to the Central Zionist Archives. But I discovered that sometimes I would ask for certain files who were not given to me. I would go into the municipality, and I was told at the municipality of Haifa that we don't have any more archives of the 20s and the 30s because the Arabs, when they left in 1948, burned them. This is what the mayor told me. And that was in the 70s. However, <laughs> luckily, there were very conscientious Israelis, many of them, some of them Zionists, who were scholars, who were doing work along with me at the archives, who told me that is not true. We have had access, and they helped me look at some of these archives, which I have my thanks to particularly Yosef Bajitz and various others who have helped me into putting the story as it really is, because that's my aim. My aim is not to tell the better story of either this party or that. I want to tell the true story. Wow, what a, what a story that is, uh, to be, have to struggle just to get the information. Many scholars go through this. I am not unique. And uh, Arab scholars have difficulty in accessing material of 1948. You have, there are even many Israeli scholars who have difficulties. The story of uh, this latest scholar, Katz, who has written on the massacres of Tantura, whose uh, even his master's degree has been reneged upon, has been taken away from him, because all of a sudden that caused an uproar and caused a political statement when it should be looked at as history. This is 1948, and we are now in 2001. It's just <laughs> shocking. Um, but in this new project, the, the manuscript, now you're taking, you're doing interviews and talking with people, but it, it's with an idea of what to remember and trying to reconstruct that. In fact, I did do quite a lot of interviews for my first research because there were angles of the study that definitely was not documented. The Arabs are less developed and evolved than the Israelis, and therefore many Arabs had not kept their memoirs, had not written their, their memoirs and their stories. I did use quite a lot of the classical Arab documentation of the mosques, the churches, and anything that was written on Haifa at the time. However, there were lots lacking. I had to rebuild the uh, uh, geography of Haifa, the map of Haifa, through the memory of some seven old men who went around with me and we retraced Haifa of the 20s and the 30s through their memories. So I understood that memory was a very important channel for me to, to target. And even during that, I did interview quite a lot of Arabs, particularly. Don't forget, my family is from Haifa. My family were well off. We are very American-oriented. My grandfather had come to the United States in 1912, so we have quite a lot of links. They were educated, and therefore I was able to get to people of my family who had lived in the United States after 48, but previously were there. So I was able to go to many of the people 
within my family and outside my family. They had linkages. It became like a, an octopus of relationships. Uh, I was able to do quite a lot of interviews all over in the Middle East, in Europe where I was studying, and in the United States. And therefore, that had become an important channel and path for continuation of my work. I have become very, very concerned and very interested in the human angle of the Palestinian issue. What has happened to the Palestinians after 48? I have lived and known the experience of the refugees. I know the kind of problems that are involved. And I was very interested in reconstructing the kind of life these people had and understanding their issue of identity, how they saw themselves and how they really reflected what they are. So my work comes stems from that angle, from that line. And in order to do it, I had to limit it to certain aspects of the work. So what I did, I haphazardly chose 15 villages, 15 destroyed villages. Because Palestine after 48, most of its villages were destroyed by Israel. And some of them are completely obliterated. Others, the ruins are still there. Others have been transformed into establishments for Jews who have, been, who have come uh, uh, into Israel. So I chose 15 villages, 10 of them in Galilee. Galilee is very much part of the area where my ancestry comes from. And five villages around, the, uh, uh, around Jerusalem area. And, uh, uh, I, I have a chart where it shows you many of these villagers were either, of the villages themselves were either completely inhabited by Christian or a combination of Christian Muslim or just Muslim inhabitants. So uh, for the duration of around seven months, I spent on a sabbatical where I went around interviewing villagers from these 15 villages. And you see, even though my collection of material is for one manuscript, but the material is huge and can produce a lot of work because my interviews are open-ended. It's life histories. So in addition to telling me about their perceptions, their identity, their life history, they tell me about social aspects, they told me about events in Lebanon, they told me. Uh, so there is a lot of material and uh, I hope to be able and produce more than just one manuscript. Well, thank you for being on Rip Rap. Thank you. Mm -hmm.